Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Art Cast, a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to uh, confront one when you are on this dangerous endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Uh, hey, when I'm not playing Keep in the Borderlands, getting my... Uh getting my elf wizard uh, leveled up. I am doing things like uh, interactive design and uh, coaching about that kind of stuff. I'm Rob Stenzinger. Good to see you again, Rob. Back for another, you, Jersey. another yeah. podcast, another Lean to Art cast. Um, and we were talking last night about this week's show and you presented a pretty interesting idea for a topic <laughs> that made us both slap our foreheads a little bit. <laughs> I was wondering if you had that react in text. It kind of sounded like that. Maybe it was, mm -hmm. it was, um, and I, I know I definitely had a slap my forehead thing where, where, uh, I was, I was brainstorming topics, you know, um, 12 whole hours before our show, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe a few more, but not that many, <laughs> uh, and thinking like, Oh, okay. This, that, the other thing, here's some things I've been talking about oh, comics. Did it wait comics? Wait, how we we talk about comics oftentimes we talk about mini comics we we visit the topic and 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 uh, like hit it from a variety of angles from other topics but rarely do we just say comics and it's kind of a hey that's weird because we we're you know we're both really into it and i mean in jersey especially having um just i mean so much of your uh, professional life being while well, teaching comics and, uh, and and getting paid to make lots of comics. So what the, you know, we have this podcast where we make, you know, we make a point of thinking really hard about what we're making and whatnot. So it's just kind of funny how that's, uh, so how did it hit you when I was like, yeah, hey. it, well, it, it reminded me that I have this default reflex when I'm brainstorming topics for the show is I say it internally, not comics because I'm worried about flooding the stream with too much talk about comics. But, but in making it a reflex, it means that we go a long time where we specifically don't talk about, the, we don't use the medium as the central subject for a discussion. We've done episodes where it's like, oh, I'm going to show how I draw a Clip Studio Paint, which is an app designed to make comics. But like talking about comics in general, you're right. We've talked about mini comics a bunch of times as a inroad to getting started communicating with images, but never like the the medium itself as a food for thought. Um, so yeah, it was one of those moments where you you like called out a blind spot where I was like, well, yeah, well, we don't talk about comics because otherwise I talk about comics all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's just kind of funny. Um, and <laughs> And yeah, and I guess for me, once in a while, I think, well, Jersey's doing this all the time. And then we, it, there's so many uh, fantastic examples and references and, and stuff that ends up, you know, infusing other topics with aspects of comics. But yeah. then, yeah, we're just, well, let's go, let's go head on at comics. <laughs> <laughs> Not like, you know, quick, look, look, there's comics. Keep going. And there, yeah, like tying it into some other main topic. And like, mm -hmm. and incidentally, this kind of reminds me of something about comics too. But yes, uh, this is something that, this is the, the topic I think about probably 80% of my day, right? Uh, wow. I think about it all the time. Uh, and and I, I'm always in love with it, right? So, and, and I, I just did a, um, a presentation a couple weekends ago at the Buckeye Book Fair in Ohio, and uh, the it was it was to a bunch of seventh graders who were all sitting like this, right? I got their arms crossed and leaned back, like I'm not going to engage with this guy. What's this old man got to say to me? And then uh, after the talk, I go. They had like a, a, a vendors area where you could like sign books for people, and it was like it was quite a ways away from the classroom, so I had to go down this long corridor, and then, and then you know I was in the back of this big hall. Um, and a couple of these kids from the class come over because now it's safe because it's like it's, you know, it's far away from everybody. Nobody's going to see them engaging with the old man. And one of the kids comes up and is like uh, asking me, you know, more questions about what I was presenting in there. And then at one point they look at me like, wow, you really, really love this stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, 
I don't know if I should apologize for that or not. <laughs> but uh, not a man. And, and the idea that there could be too much. Ah, uh, how how quirky and funny are we? Where we have not gone at this head on more more often. Yeah. I think there was a little bit where there there's been. Um, you know, maybe Lean Into Art was born after a very comic centric podcast. Lean Into Art existed in parallel mm-hmm. with one of your other podcasts that was all about comics, all that kind of stuff too. Where it's no, that's like, true. Well, that's true. Yeah, you know, we're covering different stuff. But then, yeah, I did, I did, I did almost a hundred episodes of a show called Comics Are Great. <laughs> yeah, it's in the title. It's in the title. <laughs> we don't have to <sighs> reemphasize, but it's and that was a fun show. And um, I just forgot that uh, I think I was a guest on that show. Yeah, once you or were twice. Yeah, yeah, you were a couple times. At least once. Okay, yeah. And uh, that just hit me the other day. So I don't know. All this stuff just flooding in. And yeah. uh, it's time. It's time. <laughs> dear dear dogs and cats and chickens and things. It's it's time. Uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a uh, probably a big fat love note to comics. And uh, talking about how engaging with making them um, informs other skill sets because a a number one question I get from very well-meaning but very uh, concerned and largely ignorant parents. I don't mean ignorant. I mean ignorant in the sense that they just don't know because they don't, you know, they haven't thought about Mm -hmm. comics this way um, is, well, is this a job? Is this like a real job job or is this like another job job? You know, (laughs) is this something they do on the side while they do like a proper job? And I'm, and I, and I, you know, carefully explain to them. It's like, no, there's a variety of things you can do, uh, and that to make money besides making comics, because you know how to make comics. So that I think will be in the second half of the show. And also I think there's, uh, benefits to being more visually literate. Um, I think as we, uh, I, mean, I think media literacy is a topic that is very uh, understandably uh, in, in on a lot of people's minds, and I think visual mm-hmm. literacy ties into uh, media literacy skills. We'll talk about that in the second half, I think. So, want want to hit some music to get started? Yeah, let's go there. Okay, I'm just gonna go right for the one that we naturally think of because we're already fired up. Why not just push it all the way? <laughs> There we go. We're, we're, now we're at Find 2000. those Dragon Balls. I mean comics. <laughs> so the first section is what do we love about comics? What is so great about them? Um, let's see. I, I've got some. I've actually got some slides from various workshops I've done over the years. But um, and, and also, there's an episode of the Lean Tart cast that we did. Uh, actually, it was one that I think I did with Dan Mishkin, just the two of us. I think you were off that week. And we talked about like visual storytelling quite a bit. Um, but let's see if I can find one of the examples. Um, and then I could share it on the screen. But here we go. So I don't know if you can see this on your preview uh, hmm. on Twitch. I don't fully preview. I'll, I will. I, I will jump in now and then. Okay. I want to avoid audio issues. So, yeah, yeah, I understand. See now. Yeah. Okay. So, like, I mean, wow. c- comics has this because it's so a number one thing, a thing that I get very excited about when I think about, you know, reading them and then making them and then teaching people how to make them is that it's static images. So, meaning that the images don't move. But a lot of times, comics will use imagery that suggests movement. And because of that, you can create these uh, unrealistic but perfectly understandable, clear, and plausible images that give an impression of before, middle, and after all at the same time. And that, to me, feels like something that is unique to the medium. And I tend to uh, celebrate and get excited about things that the medium has as a, as a special advantage. Now that that special advantage doesn't mean that it's always it's always uh that you should always use that, right? You shouldn't Sure. So, so like here's this image of like these characters um fighting on a Ferris wheel and they're having a conversation while they're fighting on a Ferris wheel, but then we're also looking straight down the Ferris wheel and we see people on the ground and they're doing something too. There's this simultaneity that's happening and there's also the movement of the character moving from left to right, the character, you know, parrying and trying to defend themselves. So there's 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 lots of um, 
impl- and, and also the, the, we have the implication of the movement of the Ferris wheel itself. We know that Ferris wheels move, right? So like, all at once, we've got like this before, middle, and after happening at the same time, right? Uh, Does, by, have yeah. you, um, I've been, uh, in my comics making, I tend to uh, overuse that. Uh, mm-hmm. it went, and as you were describing that, there's, it, it reminds me of, it's almost like, you know, if a, if a pro wrestler back in the day was doing their special move too much, it was going <laughs> to, that's, that was their downfall. They were going <laughs> to yeah. do it that one extra time and not see the other thing coming. And just it was wasn't going to turn out well, <laughs> and uh, but in thinking about it and how I overuse this uh, that special move uh, in in a lot of my comics, it was it's the uh, do do folks talk about this as the super moment? Because when I'm when I'm journaling about this, I call it a super moment. I've called it that in the past. Yes, I don't know. Ah, it, maybe that's it, where I got it from. I don't know if in other circles it gets talked about that way. I don't know if there's other language for it. Um, I should also say, you know, I mean, just just to frame it up properly, I'm not an academic, and I don't necessarily talk about this in maybe it leans towards academia but i don't have the jargon and i don't like to discuss this in ways where i'm presenting some kind of like uh universally applicable rubric right i like to notice patterns and i like to celebrate the patterns that i noticed and i like to use these patterns as a springboard to thinking more deeply about it if that makes sense so it yeah it totally does um but so super moment that's that's like a short like it's a nickname i came up for this idea of it's 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 a moment in a static image that has a high degree of implying movement motion and um multiple moments happen uh simultaneity in that these are happening at the same time but also it's capturing a before middle and after like before middle and after all exist at the same time in the image and the way that the artist constructs the image and guides our eye through different elements makes us travel through that before middle and after all in the same drawing that that would be how i would define it the way i'm using it um makes a lot of sense it's it's just and 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 to do that in one image is really uh yeah it it is a, it is a special move yeah it's a special move and it's an economical move uh, i feel like that's that's another thing that I, like i just think of this as like clarity and economy being like two of comics special superpowers that make me very excited um, and now I've gotten the screen the opposite of that. And this is an example that Dan Mishkin brought to that discussion, which is this iconic scene, which actually got used. It was referred to in Spider-Man um, oh, Homecoming, uh, the movie, where he is buried in the bottom of this. He's like pinned down by this gigantic machine and he's struggling and struggling to try to get out from under it while the room is filling with water. And he's having this like positive self-talk of like, I have to do this for Aunt May. You know, I, I can't leave her alone in the world. You know, I have to get out of this mess. But we see it's broken into on this two-page spread, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten panels of these individual moments of his struggle. And so that's the other superpower I can have by like adding multi- multiple moments, uh, focusing on each individual ticking of the clock. You can really slow things down to build a sense of tension so that when we get to... The release, when he finally gets it off, we do this one big splash page of like, I did it, I'm free, right? Mm. This, this scene is famous because it, it, was, it was so effective at building that tension of, and, and really suffering and sympathizing with Spider-Man as he's trying to get out from under this enormous weight so that when he does get out, it's like, oh, we feel that release, right? This is a moment yeah. that if you, if you were using the super moment, it would have been less effective, so exactly that's where it's it's uh it's helpful to consider uh when when it's you know when when is that appropriate and and uh impactful and useful yeah Um, it's almost like what what you're describing it's almost like you can you can use the ability of a super moment to be macro or micro and Mm. the it's yeah the the nature of it could be summarizing more time uh sort of you know, compressing the passage or really decompressing and then getting you into, uh, I mean, feeling how painful or, or just not, I don't know, is, is slow, t- slow time passage always painful? It's certainly a good way to just. To- no, it's not, I, I, I would say it's not always painful because when I think of, of yeah. uh, you know, authors like Seth, uh, who did Clyde Fans, It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken, Palookaville, he does that specifically just to make you contemplate 
the, the, the world. Like you're looking at the town that the character lives in and noticing the things that you might notice if you were walking through that town. Tetsuka does this thing too, like with his stories where he'll just like start off with like looking at a forest and you'll hear and then like a quick panel of just like hooves clomping through the forest and then a full pull back to see the horse running through the forest. But you're seeing most of the forest framing the horse, right? Um, so you can do this thing where it's, it's, it's uh, well, McLeod called in Understanding Comics uh, being there. You know, moments about being there. Um, so, so yeah. So, like, that clarity and economy is, like, a number one for me. Um, another one that I really love, uh, which, you know, I know I've talked about ad nauseum in the past, but, you know, we're revisiting this topic, so don't apologize Shed for the it. shackles of dis- disclaimers. That's Run right. Run free. <laughs> Comics. <laughs> so. Let's go for it. Sound elements are real and not real at the same darn time. And I love that sort of um, baton passing ambiguity of what role they perform in comic storytelling. Um, Word balloons are the first thing you read because you read comics. And so therefore you're going to follow the word balloons, which means they become a visual um, uh, wayfinding tool to help you navigate where to look on the page. You know, one of the things that like when adults who haven't read comics in a long time outside of like maybe like newspaper strips, uh, they'll a, a common question. I mean, I've been asked this dozens, if not hundreds of times is, well, which do I read first, the balloon or the picture? Right. And like to me, as somebody who's like been living comics my whole life, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you go back and forth all the time. It's like you zig and zag. Right. It's like it's like asking, where do I look on the TV screen? You know, when I'm watching TV. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I get it because it's like, well, there's words and pictures. Those are two different things. And they are. They're very different things. Words are absolutely abstract. They don't represent anything except the meaning. Right. They don't visually. There's no visual correspondence. And images are representing physical things for the most part. Right. So although they can do more. It would be interesting to have a strict household where it's like in this house, we read the images first. (laughs) Wait for the word balloons. You hold on or no, or you are the other way around. You just have this, you know, different families have different styles. Now, and, and 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 to that end, Dan Michigan has advised me in the past when I'm writing my dialogue is like write the dialogue, write the page, but then read the dialogue without looking at the images and look at the images without reading the dialogue. Right. Um, wow. That's a great idea. Actually. Oh, I've got an example of that. Um, I should pull up. Oh, it, I think it's in a PowerPoint presentation. I will pull it up. Uh, but after I talk about this page. So um, the word balloons are real in that they are design elements that you can't cover up important information with those balloons, right? You're not going to put a word balloon right over somebody's face unless you're doing it for effect, which suggests that they are sharing visual real estate on the page, which means they are equally as real as the things that are there. But at the same time, these are sounds that are emanating from people, which means that from the standpoint of the people in the images, those things are those balloons are not literally there. Right. So that excites me. And like putting them in places specifically to get you to look in specific places, what we call balloon spotting, like where you put the balloons matters. Um, That is a fun part of making them and seeing it done really thoughtfully is a fun part of reading them for me. So the example that I go to a lot in my classrooms is this Walter Simonson page where if you look at it, and I know I've used this in the show before, but it's been a while. Um, let me see if I can get if I can draw on this. If we look at the reading direction, right? Uh, that is not a good ink color. Can I get a better ink color so we can see it better? Even thicker line would be fine. Yeah, come on, Windows. Do me a solid here. Nope, it's not going to let me. But if we just look at the page, we see that following the balloons, we the first panel leads us down to the bottom of the page. On the bottom left and then read richard's balloon in the second panel which is inset between panels one and three the balloon is above his head which makes us look immediately to the right of that balloon where the time sled is sliding down the page go up to the next balloon which gets us anchored right up to the top right of the page right hmm. so like that balloon placement is like fundamental and, and essential to getting us to be able to read this page properly so that's an amazing stunt to do this kind of a layout, in my opinion. Uh, it's like I, I can't even imagine having the the 
the storytelling, the visual storytelling capacity to, to figure out that layout because it's so, it's like a racetrack for your eyes and <laughs> on, on one page. So that's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's impressive, like visual architecture going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and Walt Simonson is in my opinion, like a supreme master of comic storytelling and, and you can't go wrong reading any of his books. I mean, even if you're not into the kinds of stories that he's telling, just deconstruct what he's doing with his pages because he always finds like really inventive and interesting ways to, okay, I've got on the screen, I'm going to see if I can do a quick screen share in, um, OBS, um, to share something, uh, that, demonstrates this idea of the interdependence of the two things uh, image and word um let's go to is it browser so i should have done this earlier oh it's all uh, right this is a yeah live exciting fresh example improv <laughs> what's up uh i'll do window capture how about that and and i'll hit okay and then i'm gonna go to can i capture powerpoint there we are and will it work? Ah, oh, snap, it won't work. No. Um, I'll try to uh, add, can I just do like capture my screen? Probably. Uh, display capture, um, here we go. Yep, got it, got it, okay. So now let's see if we can see this on the screen. Um, okay. Can you can you see? What, oh goodness yeah. gracious, golly gee! It's not showing the whole thing because I've got to like adjust the s size of the capture. Thank you, OBS. You're very funny. Okay, here we go. Oh, there it is. Okay, so we've got this. This this is from Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, where he's talking about this concept of show and tell. Right when we're, when we were little kids, we do show and tell, and we have this kid saying he's holding the robot. Panel two, he says, "This is my robot." And he looks down. Panel four. Well, can you tell us about your robot, Tommy? Well, I like it because uh, it's got one of these things. And he holds up the robot. What is that, Tommy? He thinks about it again. It's this thing, and if you pull it, it goes like this. Kunk. The head flips back. Yeah. And then you can do this, and it goes up, and you flip this. I did it wrong. Wait. Look, it's an airplane now. And he smiles, right? So... Like there's a visual aspect to what he's doing, and there's a verbal aspect to what he's doing. And if we take away the images... Right, and we look at the language. Right, it's this, it's this thing, and if you pull it, it goes like this. <laughs> right, and it, so it, it's less meaningful. And if we take the images without the words, it's just this kid fooling around with this toy. We don't know what he's really doing there. Right, it's less meaningful when we take away the words and just use the images. So they depend on one another, and that's what makes them makes the medium so darn special. Uh, Brian Fees. Um, oops, go back to, there we go. Brian Fees of Mom's Cancer um, and A Fire Story once described it uh, in a talk, and I thought this was a great way of putting it. It's like, it's, like, it's like pop music, which is like not quite awesome music with not quite awesome poetry, but when you put them together, they become something better than the two of them separate. <laughs> hmm. I thought that was... That was that was a a, a a nice framing to think about how how comics works, but I uh, no, I think it, it's what's funny is I think and then folks play with those tensions a lot. Different artists really um, try to crank up the poetry, and some really try to crank up, you know, crank crank up the the their their musical virtuosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, these 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 tensions do play out. In comics and yeah it's so not a 50 50 split that. right yeah. it's not a, it's and that's another thing that mcleod talks about too is like it's it's you can move the slider towards one or the other right mm -hmm. um so that's fun too and so like the, the the big point i make in my class is that you don't have to be a great illustrator to be a great storyteller of course you can be but you know the the mastery is understanding the interplay between the, t the image and the and, and the word and like and how much image you need and what kind of image you need in order to um, tell the tell the, or dis deliver the information you're trying to deliver. So, well, yeah, and if you were leaving something out for economy, how can the words express that? And 
yeah. So somehow maybe you can't show everything, but you can tell some things ideally leaning more toward some kind of demonstrative way of telling, but how interesting though, this, uh, so the, the visual poetry, the, um, what about, um, let's see the work it takes with comics. Oh yeah. Well, so, I mean, uh, Something I've talked about a lot, I, I, I feel like I talk about this a lot in my classrooms. Maybe I don't talk about it on the show that much, but comics asks a lot of us. Um, it takes a long time to make a comics page. Um, ask anybody, you're going to get an average, I would say, total ballparking, um, between six and eight hours to draw a page of comics. But there's going to be people who take more time, people who take less time. Um, which means that if you're doing a 200-page graphic novel, you can do the math, right? And this is something with my young students. When I when I break this down for them, they they all look crestfallen, like, "Oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to be 20 by the time I finish this thing." I'm like, "Well, you won't be 20, but yes, it's going to take you a while, right?" I'm like, but on the other hand, and this is the way I like the a framing I discovered a few years back is that that's a lot of hours where you get to think about comics. That's not bad, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's yeah. I'm gonna be doing this for eight hours, but I'm gonna be like watching Let's Play videos on YouTube while I'm drawing. You know, it's like that's a lot of that's a lot of fun I get to have too. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun, and it asks a lot of us in the sense that we're playing with so many skills. We are thinking about well, every comics page presents you with a thousand choices, right? It's gonna be a big panel. It's gonna be a small panel. You're gonna be close to the character. You'd be far away from the character. You'd be looking up at them. You're gonna be looking down at them. Are there any other elements that are gonna be in the shot in order to create a sense of like tension or or, or compression or uh, expansiveness and openness? How can you get the character to say, let's go over there as only that character can say that? What kind of colors are you gonna use in the scene to deliver the kind of mood that you're trying to deliver, right? You can break your brain thinking about all the different choices that you have. Um, and that's a lot to mentally attend to. Um, on the other hand, it's like, uh, it asks so little of us <laughs> because it's like, yeah, in order to sign up and do all that, all you really need, like the, 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 the primary interface is a pencil and a piece of paper. And I know that that has the potential to sound glib because it's like, yeah, you do need, like, if you really want to do, you know, certain kinds of work, like, let's say you want to do something that looks more like, um, Jim Starlin's. Uh, uh, you know, Metamorphosis Odyssey, well, he painted that, right? So you, now you're in a situation where if you really want to pull that off, either you have to learn some mastery of digital painting or mastery of painting in order to be able to do that, right? So, but the, the, the base entry fee, the price for parking <laughs> is a pencil and a piece of paper, right? Where you go with that afterwards is up to you. So, and you get to make all the choices if you are a solo act, so that's also pretty empowering as well. So, hmm. It is so. I I can really, um, I know I, I appreciate the you know that that sort of that that effort thing, and I, I mean, the the medium itself doesn't say in order to enter you must have this many pages, right? You don't have mm -hmm. to, you don't have to make a graphic novel as your first entry and mm -hmm. uh so that like what could be let's say let's say you're a speedy six hours per page you want 128 page 180 page uh project yeah under your under your belt you want to be like well this is my my awesome accomplishment here i here i come comics world the overall effort is about 1080 hours which if you do about 40 hours a week is going to be about 27 weeks of work okay and so but, or you could do a mini comic day. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the, so it's flexible. Like how, like what, what kind of, um, what kind of work you want to, um, to get out of it? Comics doesn't demand uh, you. I mean, you can make one comic strip and it, yeah. go, six hours. I mean, and another thing I love about the medium, and this has more to do with the industry, is that for the most part, for the most part, I know there's stinkers in every industry, but for the most part, I would describe cartoonists as being pretty welcoming of that. It's like, did you make a mini comic? Did you make a comic strip there? You're one of us now. You've done what we do, right? I, mo most Good of the point. people that I cross paths with, cross paths with are not exclusionary in that way. Like, oh, well, how many books do you got? You know, so... That is a really good point. And especially um, the over, over the last decade or so, 
right? So there's there's just I think I think a lot of uh, a lot of scrappy zine artists and stuff in the '90s seem to be a little more self-deprecating. Where nowadays, like if you're making a zine, you're it's it's a properly recognized part of the overall landscape. It's no I think longer, it's, yeah, I think a lot of it, folks wouldn't say that's an ash can. Ash can, yeah, I remember that term. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, I feel like it's the the definition and the boundary of what makes one a cartoonist has become more expansive and holistic in that zines are considered part of the natural expression in addition to graphic novels, web comics, and et cetera, right? Like all of these things together are part of, and, and you were not like, I remember in the early web comics days where it was really like, there was a lot of people framing the discussion as well. It's web comics versus traditional print comics. Okay. Um, I get it. You're defining your, who you are and your tribe and, and whatnot, but I mean, it does it really have to be to the exclusion of anything else? I, I, I remember really being frustrated by that, and to the point where my first webcomic was more of a page-style comic because I had every intention of printing it, and a critique I got from some people in the webcomics community was like, ooh, it would have been nice if you tried to do like a traditional webcomic instead. I'm like, well, what What do you mean a traditional webcomic? The, the medium is like four years old, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, I mean, like, that was really their dig. Whereas, like, like, yeah, this is really beautifully done and professional looking, but, like, too bad it's not a webcomic. I'm like, but it is. I put it on the web. So, anyway, I, get, I feel like... So, you get sort of, like, format fetishes and stuff, and people get can get tribal. So, you get quirky tribes and, and yeah. exclusionary pockets here and there. But, like, these these are kind of, like, older older dialogues that I think have faded. Like, where I, I, so. I don't know where the exclusion happens. I think people are... Uh, scrappy and making comics anywhere and everywhere, right? So some mm -hmm. folks publish on Twitter, Instagram. You did that mm -hmm. with uh, yeah, Boulder and Fleet for, for that. I mean, then that entire uh, mining for trouble, right? Yeah, Boulder. mining for trouble was 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 designed to be first delivered on Instagram, and that the pages are square because of that. Because when I started it, Instagram only allowed you to do square posts, which seems so yeah. quaint now. <laughs> this is where I think uh, Scott McCloud's third comics uh comics book would uh would be smiling on you reinventing <laughs> comics reinventing Jacking comics the medium yeah 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 how funny so uh should we do a quick mention of like this is an interesting and useful trilogy of books um mm -hmm. in my opinion especially um making comics and then also uh or that was his second book right reinventing comics and then just understanding comics yeah this oh is you've got you've got like the first or second printing there that's the old cover well, as a uh, as a you know a user experience designer and a, a UI designer and whatnot, uh, this was this was quite the talked about thing in the day. Mm. And uh, you know what one might say, this is not an intentional but perhaps heavy-handed way to lead into the next half of the show, where uh, there are a variety of benefits and skills that you can take from from the medium of comics and the practice of comics. And that was really apparent in in the book uh, Understanding Comics because it was it was in, in a way about um, you know visual comprehension and contextualizing so many different design choices and creating a landscape of choices in a context of uh, well how what kind of constraints do you want to embrace and whatnot which was just speaking right to me as essentially a um, an interactive designer making nah, software yeah. during the day games at night. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that 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 uh, teases us up for the second half. You want to take a break, and then we'll talk about that. Yeah, let's do that. All right. So, in about a minute and a half, we're going to talk about. So what? So it, maybe I'm not a cartoonist, and you haven't sold me on this jersey. I'm like, well, I'm not trying to sell you. I'm just trying to celebrate. But secondly, uh, engaging with this medium in a thoughtful way will level up other skill sets that uh, may seem unconnected to comics, but there is a connection. We're going to draw those connections for you. But before we do that, I've got to thank some people who make this show possible. Those folks happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, hey, I believe in Jersey and Robin, I believe in what they do. How could I make it more sustainable? Well, you can go to Patreon.com slash lean into art. You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. And more people that do that, the more opportunities we have for the show to become fully sustainable get get our time paid for i want to thank 
five people who have been doing exactly that. First up, Nate Marcel. Thank you, Nate, for believing believing in us and what we do. You can find Nate on Twitter at Great Sea Monster. And Jonathan Warrenson. Thank you, Jonathan. It means a lot to us. And Tim F. Thank you, Tim, for supporting us. And the mysterious K. We still don't know who you are, but we appreciate your support. Thank you, K for making the show more sustainable. And finally, Ashley Knapp. You can find Ashley on Twitter at Control Alt Lee. You can join them all at patreon.com slash Lena Duart, where you will find all the shows we make. And in addition to the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Uh, it's Rob and me riffing live on it, the finding a topic through natural you know, discourse and discussion. And those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place with fellow leaners. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. Yeah, it is awesome. Thank you so much. All right. And how about <laughs> intensity? This is going to be an intense one. I, I told you in the text, I was like, oh, this this topic has the potential for a lot of positive energy on the show. So keeping it going. Hmm. All right. Um, this is, I don't know. Like I always felt, uh, I not, to, not making it about me, but like well, talking with you about comics can be mm, intimidating in some ways. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, being a, you know, a listener of your, your prior podcast and then working with you and we forming lean into art and all that stuff and all the, all the work you've done and teaching in comics and so many awesome insights that you've woven in and stuff. It's just sort of, um, uh, every once in a while when we, we, we work in, it's a narrative that comes in as far as, as, you know, I come from a pretty different angle when it comes to this topic of comics. And, and a lot of it is in a way the, the second half of the show types of things where I've found comics, this, this mine of, it was, it's been, it's a toolbox that I just sort of went, Oh, Hey, nice, nice tools you got here. Do, do, do. And I'm just like borrowing your tools and mm -hmm. my hopefully doing that respectful way and all that. And, you know, not trying mm. to, you know, um, just sort of use the wrong fork for the comic salad. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I would push back on that with saying two things. One is that, as a cartoonist, I feel it's my responsibility to um, watch with an unbiased and pass an impassive eye how other people use the tools in other media, um, because I, th their application um, may be instructive to me about opportunities that I have in my own pool. Right? Oh, you use the wrench that way? Holy crap! I never thought of that. Maybe I should try using the wrench that way in my in, in my work, right? Um, Dan Mishkin once described, so Kurt Swan. Kurt Swan is a cartoonist who is uh, most known for his depiction of Superman in the 1950s and 60s. And in my, for my money, he is the definitive Superman artist. Like when I think of Superman, I think of the way Kurt Swan drew him. Uh, Jerry Ordway is a close second. Um, and, and nobody can draw him the same. Like, like anybody who else tries to draw Superman, they don't capture something about the character that Kurt Swan intuitively got. He was a master. Many artists will report that, yes, Kurt Swan was the reason that I draw comics, right? Kurt Swan in the early 80s was heading towards the end of his career, and in comes this young upstart named George Perez, who is now like considered like a great, great master of the medium. He drew Crisis and Infinite Earth, the Infinity Gauntlet, right? Like he's, he's, he's in JLA versus Avengers. He is, he has, a very, very well-earned reputation. Kurt Swan is in the offices of George Perez and he's leaning over his shoulder going like, hey, so what are you doing there? How are you doing that? Like he was, he, even though he is like full on, you know, he's a legend, he's very far into his career, he was eager to learn from younger uh, uh, developing professionals new ways to approach what he does, right? And I feel like that curiosity and that sort of openness to discovery is almost a a moral imperative <laughs> mm. if, if you wanted if, if you take your art seriously i feel like that is absolutely it is upon you 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 are called to have that um i don't want to make any predictions about the moment you say i've learned all i need to know you're no longer good that no that, that, that that's not true i've seen people who like who are are less curious but still pr perform like enormous amounts of mastery but i just feel like there's like there's a moral component to learning from other people and 
watching other people use your tools. Like, so Into the Spider-Verse was a Spider-Man movie, which used a lot of comic book storytelling techniques. And I could get all huffy and puffy about like, but it's got motion, so it's not comics. Well, yeah, it's not comics. But like the way they employed some comic storytelling techniques, I think enhanced the movie and made the movie more visually dense and interesting. And it, I think minute for minute delivered more story than another kind of movie could. Um, so like, I, I think in particular the scene where Miles Morales is like first developing his powers and he's getting stressed out and all those like caption boxes start popping up behind him to, and like the size of the caption box is emphasizing the level of tension and stress that's going on in his head as he's like, what's going on with me? Why am I sweating so much? I don't know if you remember the scene, but I do, yeah, but yeah. So, uh, and then, and then they, like it backed off in other scenes, like when like the prowlers holding Miles over the top of the roof, and it's a very emotionally tense scene, tense scene for a variety of reasons. And like they back off all that comic book storytelling stuff because like let's just be quiet and and and, and embrace this moment that is making us all feel big feelings, right? So anyway, um, that was a long way of saying like I don't think that I watch you employ the tools and think about respect or disrespect right i think it's like it's like okay let's see what let's see what you're doing with it i don't remember what my second point was going to be about that i went on too long of a jag <laughs> no it's uh well I've, there, you hit a lot of themes it, it, okay. the, the openness to learning the um like in a, an, a resource for learning i mean it's a fantastic um that's a really um, practical way to do research is to just see what other people do Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's real, uh, observable phenomena as they say, um, because people say this, but people do that. And, you know, that's seeing how, seeing how the tools get used is, is, uh, is a great resource to, um, you know, just find out something new potentially, um, or at the very least, you know, in the newness can be just, you know, similar strength in a new context and say, mm -hmm. Oh, this can work over here. This can work in motion. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what um, what do you think as far as uh, so I don't mean to like overly state because I wonder about the I wanted to bring up the like the McLeod books because uh, they were such a touchstone for me and I think I'm not alone and and I think it helped um, sort of well uh, create a beacon that a lot of other sort of visually inclined and and sort of cognitive load designer type folks went, Hey, wait a minute. Look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, all this, the, like there's, it really said, come take my tools basically, uh, to, a, to quite a, quite a broad crowd. And, um, and I wonder too. So one, one side question, is that book well known anymore? Do people still reach I for it? I think so. I think okay. so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I Especially mean, it, understanding comics. Yeah, I think I think especially that uh, re reinventing. So McLeod actually, um, I got to have dinner with him. Uh, what was it last year? Uh, he came and did a talk in Ann Arbor, and um, fabulous talk. And he's he one of the the ways he framed up his his discussion on like how we need to think better about visual storytelling is he um, shows uh, the sign in a hotel about like what to do in case of fire. And it shows like the person descending the stairs and like you're showing different placements of it. Like like this, in one case, the fire was on like on the staircase. The person's running away from the fire. And then in other cases, like the per the fire was at the bottom of the stairs. The person was running to the fire, you know. Um, and he showed awesome. how like, and he was like, he's like, there's no such thing as an unbiased image because he shows like the traditional handicap parking symbol, which was a person like uh, a stick figure sitting in a wheelchair. And then he shows another one where the, the stick figure is leaning forward, which this one is being more adopted and they're leaning forward and pushing on the, the wheels. And it's like a more yeah, active Yeah, I love that one. Post. I think that was designed by Sarah Hendren. The, um, huh. Yeah, because I actually saw a talk by her and, at I.O. <laughs> ah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that whole uh, it's you, this, it transforms that the the so many of the same glyphs are present or or, or uh, shape regions are in that like the the static the the, the wheelchair with the straight spine yeah. uh, um, occupant and then yeah. another one where the, they're they're leaning forward and almost like they it looks like they're just gonna zoom and yeah yeah. And it, it changes, it, it, 
it, it it's like I, I in my comics classes I talk with my students and I, I I call it visual adjectives right it's like I I draw a, a baby made of smooth shapes and I draw a baby made of triangles and I call it, behold the terror of triangle baby and I'm like well noun baby <laughs> noun baby I change the shape of that baby it changes how you feel about that baby right so yeah it's there's it literally is in my mind visual adjectives and visual poetry but um. But anyway, when I was having dinner with him, we talked about his books, and he said that, like, you know, reinventing is the one that everybody's like, I tried reading it. <laughs> so, like, reinventing comics is, like, less known, uh, but understanding is still, like, considered, you know, it's still, I think, widely known. Um, so. I'm going to plug reinventing, even though it's been a long time since I've read it. Mm-hmm. What I think it is, it's an artifact of someone who studied so hard and looked for the applied... Um, like sort of the practical business aspect. So reinventing comics is the business book more, yeah, more so, right? It is. And it has the, the aspects of if read a, read a, uh, like, like read articles at business insider or whatnot, or some, so like a public, uh, publication sources that are really trying to say, Hey, this is the trend of business in the next few years and stuff. It has that kind of thing to it. And what's funny is it actually, was po- I think it point it was prescient in a variety of ways. So maybe it's Absolutely. an interesting historical artifact. But. Well, I, I think I think it, the other thing that I think the the criticism that gets leveled at it is is based on the premise that it was making predictions. Whereas I never read it that way. I read it as he is asking fundamental questions about how does this free and open platform change the way we do what we do. And he, he, he offers some thoughts and I, and like, I guess predictions in the sense that maybe it'll be this, maybe it'll be that. And until we un- unpack and, and figure out this whole problem of distribution of money over this network, you know, uh, BitPass was one of the things he championed early on. And he still he still kind of groans when you bring it up. I'm like, but you know what? I didn't read it that way as like, that's the answer. That was a answer to a fundamental problem that you pointed out to us. So it's it has the voice of a strategist, right? In, in, yeah. in, right? Where it's yeah. it's like someone trying to work out core dynamics and how they play out over time in with 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 a lot of context. And Which so is, I think it's yeah. it's a really credible document. And I think so too. Uh, and I and I yeah. think it, it it the it breaks the moment you ask whether or not he was right about the the ultimate answer, which I don't I don't think the book was trying to do. But that kind of thinking, right? So mm-hmm. in a way, he was bringing sort of. Um, well, I mean, like in, in his other work too, um, various analytical disciplines, uh, you know, essentially a, applying, um, you know, researching the business of comics and the medium's capabilities and how, how are there interesting intersections there. And I think that demonstrates uh, an interesting across discipline type work that you can do with comics. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's in the, uh, uh, Thinking about all these discrete problems can, will will cause you to see the world differently. <laughs> yeah. And you could even even if you if you follow the the analytical eye path, you can end up McLeodian, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> and you could do that kind of uh, and and not no, it's not it's um, it's it is it's it's ty- it's a type of masterful work, mm-hmm. and it's a path. I'm not saying you know, read this book and you're, you're about to, um, spit out deep, uh, deep analysis. Yeah. One, one step, but no, it's a path. Yeah. Agreed. And so, yeah, I think the book is, is, is a meaningful work in that way. So, but to the, the tease that we made digging in more of that, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm curious what overlaps you've discovered in the other fields that you engage with having made comics, but then also work on UI UX interactive design. Like what are some of the things that having made comics and reading comics, have you found that like has offered you um, new approaches or new affordances or even, you know, like just maybe even breathing new life into other um, skill sets that you use in your work? Uh, One of the key things is, is just visual and narrative hybrid. So visual narrative and the, the, the the pursuit of practicing storytelling is in itself very useful, but there's the kind of storytelling in comics that I think makes it extra portable and useful. 
where uh, you're providing. So if you're if you're creating an application, you're creating a website, you're creating your portfolio, you're doing something online somewhere that's interactive. It's there's probably digital, but it doesn't have to be digital. But you've got this uh, presentation of information over time, and maybe a progressive disclosure, and also building of key points and learning along the way. It's 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 great for uh, sort of structuring interactive experiences um, through time as a dialogue and considering deeply considering the, the 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 sort of understanding you're creating over time that kind of thing so like the design analysis intentionality of uh, the 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 elements and stuff and also what message are you trying to get across with these elements as opposed to saying, well, you can design without that stuff. You can say, Hey, we need to put some features on this, this page. And then you, you run into less so now because of the widespread use of, of um, well, even people borrowing design patterns from one another. But in the days before that you get interactive experiences with just piles and piles and piles of features. Like think about the older versions of like Microsoft word and, um, you know, the, well, I don't know, like, honestly, um, I think we still, we, the, we, yeah, there's still plenty of rough edges and challenges in a variety of common UIs, but, um, I think the, let's see. So f- I, I'm honestly crediting things like the, the visual comprehension and practice and visual communication that books like understanding comics and more and more people um, consuming comics casually and all that kind of stuff has helped with making uh, more common, better design overall in software. Mm. Um, And then for me, it's like the, especially it's the narrative and time and the dialogue, but what else? Um, I went really specific pretty uh, for a while for about, let's see, 2002 to 2006, I was working on a game called Jinhanu that was a, um, I mean, how, let's see, it was a, um, it's a two-dimensional, two-dimension explore landscape and talk with other characters kind of thing. It was a lot of, uh, a little bit light RPG with with a lot of uh, story being told. And the story was uh, being told in, in, you know, a lot of uh, classic RPGs, you could have like a a character head and then uh, a block of text next to them. But then I was getting really into how this, the game engine that we were building um, could be so much more expressive and specific based on, well, your relationship to a character all of a sudden could change how they say something back to you. And mm-hmm. this reminds me a lot of an exercise that you do um, with the, let's see, what do you, what do you call it? Where the, essentially you, you have uh, some, some text on your, your dry erase board and you say, yeah you know, what does this sound like to you? And then you put a yeah. word balloon around it. And then now what does it sound like? And now you make, you change the shape of the word balloon and say it again. Yeah. So actually I have this uh, or locked and loaded. I didn't know if we were going to do this one, but uh, if you want, I can do it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I got on the screen, three lines of dialogue. It's or actually the same dialogue three times. Right. And so I have the class read them as a group and I go, what, no eggs, what, no eggs, what, no eggs. And I say, Oh, you've read them all pretty much the same. Now all I'm gonna do is change the shape in the line and watch what happens. I'm gonna draw a smooth balloon around one, pointy balloon around the second one, and then a drippy balloon around the third one. <laughs> right? And I asked him to read it again. And I say, okay, the first one is what? No eggs. The second one's like, what? No eggs. And the third one's like, what? No eggs, right? Um, and then I say to them, so in other words, I change, did I, I pulled this up on screen, yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I say, I, I change the shape and the line and you hear different voices in your heads. You know, like, and, and I, I, I really mean this. I'm being absolutely serious when I say, like, that's magic. That is magic to say that I can change a shape and a line and you hear a different voice, right? And I tell my students, like, that's the power you're playing with. So let's, let's be thoughtful and responsible with what we do with this. So, and, and again, it didn't take much drawing to get there. Not at all. And, uh, let's see. So using that, that I was, I was working to, I was using that heavily in the, 
in the in the game engine that uh, mm. that we were making as far as uh, word balloon borders, panel borders, um, all that kind of stuff, and presenting um, UI choices in as as sort of uh, honestly interactive comic pages in a way, with mm. uh, each panel being an action choice. So it was it was I was exploring making an interactive language with the comics language, and it was it was a ton of fun and totally you know it really it, it affected me. And so later on, I actually started making more comics. Uh, as specific, you know, page-based comics, not not emphasis, not, not interactive uh, comic language as games or in games. But then all that stuff. I mean, it it influenced a lot of things that I do, where I was bringing in, um, uh, like how I'd facilitate meetings evolved, and I started doing a lot more visual note, live visual note taking and doodling, and um, then let's see capturing documentation and explaining the the flow of a well a user journey over time and you know capturing key moments and making a uh a, you know a simple narrative that i think almost anyone in the room could draw but then just being able to think in the way of a um like finding beats and story moments and stuff in like what's being said so all of a sudden we could have like a, a a clearer shared understanding of of a context, the situation, and and have people all talk about that and gather ideas, and then what happens next, and how do we get there and stuff. It's uh it's great as a collaborative mechanism for um, bringing people together with their ideas. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, facilitation of meetings and also um. Yeah, capturing capturing information to clarify and and understand what's being discussed and negotiated together through things like visual note taking. Um, I've only done it a couple times myself, but I remember I, a couple years ago at a nerd camp, uh, I was I was on a, a panel with a bunch of children's book authors, and most of them were writers. But then there was me and one other artist, Larry Day, a children's book uh, artist, and. I said, like, hey, you know what? Like, Larry and I, our first language is drawing. <laughs> we're less less good at the verbal stuff. So how about you just give us a couple of drawing pads, and we're just going to draw out. We're going to draw what is being discussed in this room. Like, so the, everybody else can just you use to do the panel, and we'll capture it. Uh, and it became this awesome artifact of this. And, and it became more... Uh, well, artifacts are permanent. Like they, they suggest permanence, right? A panel discussion is an ethereal, live thing that is less interesting to attend as a recording. It's better to be there in the moment, right? Uh, but like the the sketch noting became this visual artifact, and it was interesting to see how Larry and I both visualized some abstract concepts, right? Um, and made them more grokkable for an audience. So that, yeah. Uh, that was something that our experience as visual storytellers uh, allowed us to do. So, and it had nothing to do with making comics, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, but those same skills uh, are, are um, they're, they're infused. That's, I mean, it's, does comic do, do, you know, let's see, does the, uh, does the medium and all the discipline and the community of comics own all these things? No, I mean, comics borrows from places too. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, oh yeah, certainly. It's certainly a, uh, a, a a wider spread touchstone that helps introduce people to these things. Like for instance, I mean, even the disciplines of uh, involved in user experience design, the you know the the working through you know collaboration and the the sort of perspective taking to express um, needs and behaviors as personas or the. Um, uh, let's see, doing the research, all that stuff. It's all borrowed from other places, but we say UX, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a well-known um, gateway place to go to those capabilities and make use of them. I, I also think about how there's, there's a similarity, like in a, in a fundamental sort of big picture way of we're both making something that's meant to be engaged with. It's an interactive, comics is an interactive medium in that the choices I make between two panels is going to ask less or more of a reader as far as making inferences, right? So like when you do like a big change between two panels, like in panel one, it's a close up of a person's face and panel two, it's a big opening shot, a wide shot of like a, a, a future city. Um, you got to make some leaps there to figure out like, okay, well, what do these two images have to do with one another? 
Whereas if the changes are small, there's less inferencing that is that has to be made. So they think about that Spider-Man sequence I showed where it's just a sequence of him slowly pushing this thing off of his back, right? Um, and so too, in uh, I, I, I know I'm a one-note guy, uh, but I've been listening to a lot of like design essays on the Metroid series because I, I find it endlessly fascinating. And also I'm hungry for Metroid Prime 4 to come out and I'm just trying to fill that hunger with whatever I can until it comes out. But like... One of the things that like a lot of these design uh, essays cover is that the first thing you're supposed to do in the first Metroid game is go left, and how that is just like such a fundamental difference in from what everything you were doing in a platformer up until that point. In a platformer, you went left to right, and that's just what you do. But in Metroid, the first thing you need to progress in the game, you can go right all you want, but you can only get so far until you go back to the left and then find the morph ball. And once you got the morph ball, you can do a lot more things. So it teaches you in, in this uh, really nonverbal, visual way, you can go anywhere you want and you can go back and forth and you're encouraged to go back and forth. And if you go back and forth, you're going to find neat things that help you move forward in the game. Um, and so that was thinking about how do we use image and how do we use design to teach the person how to do the thing so that when they do it, they're also delighted by it. Right, because there's that whole idea of like if it, you you want to feel the achievement of learning the thing, right? So I feel like th those skills are very very intertwined. They're the, they're the same skill. We're doing the same thing. We're thinking about what's the how's the person going to interact with this? Who is my user? Right? Uh, is is am I making this for kids? Am I making this for grownups? Um, am I making this for somebody who is very, very literate in comics, or am I making this for somebody who maybe has never read a comic before? For Second Books, uh, the publisher of Science Comics Rockets, they've said in these words, we make comics for people who don't necessarily read comics all the time, right? So that becomes, that informs what design choices you make. Is this going to be a, a book where I'm going to be really showing off all the affordances of comic book storytelling? Well, I can maybe do a little bit of that, but really I have to be thinking like much more about clarity, you know? That's where, I mean, it is such a compelling place to, to visit, to practice and express and uh, like skill build. So, the, and then you can carry that back and forth where, because there is so much intersection between design and comics, storytelling and comics and storytelling and, uh, communicating the value of a design and what's a design i mean it's it's some kind of uh proposed solution to a problem and in a way isn't you know that what that's what narrative is too it just unfolds in in a story um mm -hmm. and so there's so much to borrow back and forth between the two i think like for instance one one uh, uh the one thing is the pres whether or not you're comfortable in performing the presentation aspect of um well pitching an idea in a business context mm -hmm. the skills you you've built as as in you know in comics and storytelling and whatnot those help you be ready to um arrange a strong um a strong case for your ideas so to sort of say well uh, just like you pull someone into into a story and you get them curious and caring and participating because it's not a passive medium, you're doing that with your thoughtful um, arrangement of of ideas over time and and you know some maybe a pitch deck or um, handout poster whatever and. Yeah, yeah. I, I think about this when I'm doing presentations as well. And um, it's funny. I just I literally just got a text from a friend who was at the dentist who somehow I came up in the conversation and the dentist had been to my nerd night talk about eighties cartoons, um, from a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and he was, he basically, the dentist was like, like, Oh my gosh, the, it changed the way I thought about eighties cartoons. And to which I responded to my friend, I was like, well, as long as I can get, if I can get just one more person to say, eh, they don't hold up, then my time will have meant something on this earth. <laughs> but <laughs> but one of the things I think that made that talk successful was I was really thinking about how do I do this like a comic where the images and the words are dependent on one another and so that I don't just have a bullet pointed list that I read from with each slide. The slides are just images. They're just images. There's no text on them at all. Uh, and what you have to look at them and hear what I'm saying and put those two ideas together in order to get to what the big idea is here. So...
Sure. You're, you are like living word balloons in that case. Yep. Trying uh, to be. As a purposeful design choice. Yep. Um, hmm. And, and, and even in the way the timing works, right? So like there's a slide where I show like sad Prince Adam and he's like, it's Prince Adam making a sad face. And I'm like, and I, and that punctuates this moment where it's like, I, everything's joyful. And then I feel sad because people don't understand this thing. And then, you know, it's a big laugh and then I move on to the next point. So, yeah. Ah, that's so awesome. The, 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 the sort, the sort of practicing the flow of how you share your ideas is you can't help but practice that if you work on making comics. Yeah. yeah. And that is going to be incredibly helpful wherever you bring it next. You will at the, like anywhere you go, your, your, uh, your community, your, um, I don't know, your, your team meetings at bit in your, in your business or clubs or what have you, you're giving them a, a better version of, of whatever you're sharing. If you're, if you're using these skills, because uh, there's, yeah, we can all think of plenty of examples where presentations aren't designed so thoughtfully and uh, they don't yeah. have delightful, sad Prince Adam to <laughs> that punctuates a moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you can attend one of Scott McLeod's talks, I mean, I know this has been kind of a pro Scott McLeod discussion, but he has a lot of interesting things to say. Um, and his talks are, um, uh, they really demonstrate that idea very thoughtfully. He's like super masterful at it um, to the point where I remember I was, I was doing a, uh, a presentation at, at the Toronto comic arts festival several years ago. And I didn't know, I didn't know the speaking order. And then when I got there, I found out McLeod was going first and then I watched his talk. And the, the, the more I, the, the further we got into it, the more excited I was about comics in general, but the sadder I was that, Oh, I got to follow this. And I did not. <laughs> deliver what he delivered <laughs> uh I, I i gave it my best shot but it was i know i was coming in i was coming up short right because like when you're when you're uh, coming up following that level of, so my point is i was trying to make a, like a lighthearted way of saying like he, his his talks are very like you could i wish he would record them because they really deserve to be dissected and unpacked to see what he was doing uh, uh right Anyway, no, uh, you're right. That would, uh, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't envy you having, uh, to having to be the, the second act. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm very joyful in, in the way I say, like, it, I did not deliver because I knew I couldn't, right? Like, I, I wish if I was in the audience next to myself at the time, I'd be like, dude, this frees you up. Like, you, you, you can't win. So don't try not to just, you know, don't try to win. Just do what you can, right? Because there's there, there's freedom in knowing that you're never going to be able to do that good. So, um, okay, are we are we coming up on final thought? Uh, yeah, I think so. It sounds uh, we've 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 covered a lot of things. I mean, so yeah, applications, skill sets, uh, the the sort of I mean the the portability of the tools. I mean, this is a, what what are we? Uh, let's see, what are we? What are we leading up to for final thought? Hmm. Um, hmm. I guess I would say what's like a final thought could be like, what do we think about like if we've gotten somebody who has never maybe done it before curious about either reading a comic or making a comic, what would be an activity to do or a thing to read um, after engage after making it to the end of this discussion? Gotcha. Wow. So thing to thing to do, thing we, to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What do you right, do well, with all this excitement? Let's <laughs> yeah, let's help someone out. That's right. Okay. So uh, in about a minute and a half, two minutes, we'll talk about that. What do you what do you do? What do you what do you see? Before we do that, we gotta thank some other people who make the show possible. Those people happen to be us. We make the show possible. We make lots of things, and then we bring the thoughts that occur to us when we make these things to the show to make a show. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is something we mentioned earlier in the show, Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire, a book called Mining for Trouble. And it is a 92-page graphic novel, which you can get in print or in digital by going to books.jadros.com. And it is a story of two best friends, uh, clothed animals, as C.S. Lewis called them, uh, anthropomorphic 
characters who go off adventuring, looking for to help people who might have problems, and they come across this mine that is under attack by these weird stone little girls who eat precious metals and have various abilities being stone little girls. And uh, the tension comes in the story where Fleet wants to be the most famous adventurer of all time. She thinks that the way to do that is to have a big uh, scorecard of lots of defeats of bad guys. And Boulder is much more interested in uh, turning bad guys around and making them into good guys and seeing how he can find common ground with them and maybe even make them into friends. So you have two different approaches and watching them navigate and negotiate those two approaches to achieve the same end uh, is the, the vehicle for the storytelling of Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire, books.jdrose.com. Now, Rob, you do another thing that is related to what you do on this podcast, which is helping people navigate discussions and thoughts. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's coaching. That's where uh, you can hire a professional coach like me, or actually, or my wife, Kate, to help you through thinking through your, you know, navigating choices. We are all, you know, working on building our, you know, creative paths and our businesses. And there's always something that is, uh, or even a series of somethings where it's, it's like, if you had someone that could be a bit of a brain trust and a bit of a, um, like a, a really thoughtful ear, there's nothing like it. So even in like, um, uh, getting trained as, in, as in coaching, um, it's so similar to so much of what I've done in UX, but actually I've dedicated, I've done some training in this coaching stuff and like coaches can be surprised how much coaches help even coaches. <laughs> and cause, because as you're practicing this, you realize that, um, as much as you have your own thoughts, you're not listening to them as you're, as you're having them. And so it's someone else being there listening and, and, and asking thoughtful questions about moving things forward and where to go next, all there for you about you. Uh, that's, that's just, it's, it's not as, it's not a common thing and it's okay that it's not easy to do on your own. So, um, well, it's, so anyway, you're like, well, what kinds of things, you know, would, would you, would you think through or whatnot? There's probably, um, it's probably stuff that you're working on trying to build next that you're, that you feel stuck or those conundrums that are like, oh, these two choices, mm, you could never, you know, I'm, I, I don't know which one, which way to go, this project or that project. And uh, well, this is where uh, you can, you can just even try out coaching, go to robcoach.me you'll get to my landing page. You can do a quick sign up, schedule a free discovery session to see how that would work if I were your coach. And then you can set up um, a package of sessions if you would like after that. But uh, first one's free. So uh, check it out at robcoach.me and um, you know, learn, learn how that kind of coaching experience works for you. And if you uh, haven't signed up yet for the Lean Into Art Discord. We have a forum now. We have a place where you can hang out with fellow leaners and interact with us, uh, You know, share different work that you're doing or even like reactions to the show and topic requests. And the invite link is in the show notes for this episode. And uh, it's free to sign up. And it, it works out of a, uh, a mobile app, which is easy enough to use. And then there's also special tiers, uh, special chat rooms for people who support us on Patreon, where you can share works in progress and ask for brain trust uh, you know, reactions to work. There's been some great discussions going on in there where people are sharing different works in progress and other leaners lining up to help them you know, evaluate the, the problems that they're trying to solve. I've even been posting some stuff in there about like, hey, what do you guys think of this? Uh, what do I, what, what's the best way to solve this problem? So that's the Lean Into Art Discord. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's been interacting with us there and interacting with the stuff that we make. It means a lot to us. Okay, so what's right. the thing? What's the thing? I'm excited about comics. You got me fired up. I want to do something with comics today. Um. Do you, have, do you have like a do you, do you have a shop that you go to to get your comics or do you go to like Amazon or bookstores or what? I am let's see just sort of an opportunistic comic purchaser, right? So if I go to an an event, I try to leave with a comic or two, right? Mm. Um so an event where there's an artist alley or there's tabling and that kind of thing and you the artists or artists are there directly. I try to I try to get a comic or two and which is just who knows what you discover through the, you know, the curation of the event and who, which aisles you walk down or what have you. 
And that's a lot of fun as a just a uh, adventurous discovery, right? Um, but then, yeah, I, there's a few comic shops that I'll, I'll go to, you know, a few times a year, but it's not a it's not a frequent thing for me. And then my, most of my comics buying and consuming is, um, let's see, I would say through like social media and web comics, and then um, then you know buying them online. Mm. I've been considering the all you can eat sort of comic arrangements too, where there's oh like there's comicsology. A, yeah, there's a couple of those, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, so haven't haven't uh, jumped in yet though. How about you? I, I well, I feel like a, a a critical problem to solve with getting into reading more comics is just being able to say like get readers advisory right, and not all comic shops are created equal. Um, when I lived in Ann Arbor, in Ann Arbor, the Vault of Midnight was a great place to walk in and go like, hey, these are topics I'm super interested in. Do you have anything about that are comics about that? And and fortunately, we're in like this golden time where there's comics about nonfiction now, right? And we didn't even talk about that. Like the fact that in Jim Otaviani, who does a lot of nonfiction comics, I think very accurately and astutely pointed out that like science books are filled with images because some scientific principles are better delivered visually than described with words, right? Mm. Um, you start talking about spin particles and how you can have spin particles that have a spin of 0.5 where it's like, or two or whatever, where it's like, if you turn it once, it looks different than when you turn it twice or it can have a spin of three. We have to turn it three times before it looks the same. Um, mm. It's like, what does that mean, right? It's like, okay, well, but let me draw you a diagram. Let me draw you a picture anyway. Um, I'm probably getting that wrong. It's been a long time since I've read Hawking's, uh, you know, the, the brief history of time. But, um, Anyway, but, but so like you can walk into a comic store and say like, I'm really into American history. I'm really into this, this, this science topic. I'm really into mathematics. There are comics that correspond to these and a thoughtful shopkeep will help you connect with those really, really uh, effectively. So. I, so locally there is one, one that is sort of the juggernaut in the, um, the Minneapolis St. Paul area I live is uh, the, uh, the source comics. Mm. And uh, they do games and comics and collectibles and all that stuff, but it is very much a, um, yeah, it's a really good, well, you know, big, well-stocked uh, comic shop with very helpful people. They do some really neat events and stuff, and that's oh, I try to cool. get there, even though it's like a you know pretty big commute, it's it's worth it. Um, so it's neat to actually, yeah, just see what um, uh, you know, see what other folks are buying, and also you know get that get those. Um, recommendations from you know people who are there every day yeah and just you know, probably hugely enthusiastic to be so immersed in what's new and coming out every day yeah 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 and yeah you know, that's their job is to be knowledgeable about that but again like not all comic shops are the same i mean i've been to ones where they're not quite as helpful or maybe they have like a very very narrow range of of product and interest right so yeah it's, there's it's, another one which i will not name that I'm like standing in line with uh, my two kiddos and there's like stuff that's like way not all ages right there at their eye level <laughs> yeah, in a or, long line. And, and I'm I've, like, well, I guess we're going to have some, you know, interesting questions <laughs> and discussion now. Daddy, what's the male gaze? <laughs> Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. or I've been to ones where I'll say like, do you have this? And they're like, I don't know. Why would why would you want that? <laughs> like, okay, well, I just walked want? in with with money, and I said like, I thought you might want it, and then, but then again, you seem to not want it. So, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's true. Like there is a there's a strange you know hodgepodge of those those yeah. establishments, but then the good ones are are um, pretty fantastic. So yeah, hopefully you have. Uh, one. So yeah, I don't want to recommend any specific book to read, except that maybe if you wanted to read like uh, Eisner's books, Comics and Sequential Art, Mort Walker has a book on how comics work. Um, And then McLeod's book, uh, Understanding Comics, would be great places to get a little bit more excited about this stuff. Um, And then yeah, you um, Alex Simmons, The Art of Making Comics? Thank you. Yes, Alex Simmons, friend of the show. He has a book on how to make comics too. And Alex is a as if you've been listening to the show for any amount of time, you've heard him. He's a wise person who thinks very deeply about what he does. So yeah, mm-hmm. Alex Simmons's book would be another one that we can link to in the show notes. And then as far as like things to do, um, 
There is, if you do a search at uh, minicomics.com or just look up eight-page minicomic template, which I'll also link in the show notes, it's a way to take a single piece of paper, fold it three times, cut once, and suddenly you have a minicomic booklet. And the, th- the thing is that your panels are only maybe three inches tall by like an inch and a half wide. So you don't have space to draw awesome. And what I like to do with my students is, is challenge them to make an eight-page mini comic. And the the framework that I do for it is I say like, okay, pick a topic that you are either passionate about or you know a lot about. Like how to do something, like how to make a sandwich or something like why Lord of the Rings is the best book series of all time. Write down five five steps or five reasons. Five steps are like the five steps to making a sandwich, the five steps to fixing your water heater, the five steps to setting up your Nintendo Switch, whatever, right? Something you know how to do. Or five reasons. So five reasons Lord of the Rings is the best. Well, Gandalf is awesome. Uh, Smeagol is really scary. Sauron is a big eye, whatever. You just come up with five reasons, okay? Now you got eight pages, which means that you got five reasons for the five reasons or five steps are the five pages in the middle, but then you got a cover. That's that's your page one. Page two is your introduction. This is where your narrator is going to show up and say, hi, today I'm going to teach you about this thing. Then you go through your five steps, and the last page is congratulations. Now you know about this thing. So now you've got a framework and a structure about a subject that you really care about that you can now try to tell in comic book form, right? So that would be the, the thing I'd point to. Yeah. What a great what a great uh, lesson right there. So then if... if um if I may, we have talked about mini comics multiple times on yeah. our show as well. Yeah. yeah. So you can find like it, like essentially I, I really want to um, highlight how feeling good about finishing something is worthwhile. If you are beginning this endeavor, or even if you uh, are reconnecting with this endeavor, um, I, and, and you've, you've done it lots in the past or, or what have you. It's just mini comics are a, valid useful powerful fun approachable a uh versatile mechanism to do lots of things like like um that that step-by-step guide whatnot um i've seen folks tabling with uh uh like cooking recipes or uh and whatnot but just unpacked in mini comic form where it's not just a, a recipe card that compresses all time into a list right that's it's this it's easier it's more approachable mm-hmm. but um not so uh, let's see. As a reader, it's it's it has its utility as well compared to other ways of compressing and summarizing stuff. So, anyway, mini comics uh, and f- and f- and finish a mini comic is is a great place to to embark. And the, yeah, yes. And the thing about a mini comic is it there's no room to draw awesome it's not about drawing awesome it's about expressing ideas visually and just get those lines thrown down on the piece of paper and finish the thing because finishing the thing is i think crucial to keeping your engagement with a thing that satisfaction Mm -hmm. of finishing a thing helps get you to do it again so yeah now you've got a thing that you can examine you think well what can i change next time around and whatnot as opposed to um there there there's plenty of traps to get caught into as far as um Re, like moving the goal for you and as far as ma- writing your story and in like other other habits and demons i guess uh see uh lucy bellwood's uh demon under demon posts. dialogues yeah, yeah. Demon dialogues it's yeah uh plenty of ways to to um prevent prevent succeeding but then um mini comics are they're what, what else let's see what, i don't know how can i say the I'm, I'm going to go a little further. You can do non-precious, totally not precious uh, doodle a mini comic, right? And you can, you, you can also s- take small steps toward increasing the, the sort of fidelity and complexity and whatnot, because you could work big and then make it small or whatever. So like I did a 24, 24 hour comic as a mini comic, the toughest hippo goes to bunny town, but then there's uh, stuff like uh, heavyweight lifting of the heart, which is also a mini comic, but then there's a lot more detailed story and art in there. And still it's small and not that many pages and stuff. So what's cool is like the project, it's not like, Oh, I could never do it in a mini comic because it would never hold all these ideas. It's like, no, nah, mini comics can grow with you a little bit too. So mm-hmm. flexibility. that's true. Yeah, it's, it is a very flexible format. And I have done like very finished looking work in mini comic form. Um, 
So yeah, Captain Cat, former shark hunter, is one of my more popular um, mini nice. comics that I take to shows. And I mean, here's the center spread, which is you know, it's not too bad. It's like I, I worked on it. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, yeah, and so you, but you didn't have that much. That much uh, as far as uh, like a page count that was uh, daunting, right? So you yeah. had this this really, um, you know, rendered awesome. Um, which I someday I need to do that with a mini comic. So I'm going to add one more level. So you could start to you could start to add a little more polish to your mini comics, and there's plenty of room for that. But then actually taking advantage of the center spread. Nope, still haven't done that. Ah. <laughs> That's a goal I would like to do at some point. But it's just adding one little thing. It's not, it's not yeah. um, so daunting. It's not a, not achievable. So um, and then then it's a sellable thing. People will, um, and oh ah, it's also a business card. There you go. Yeah, I mean I've I've long ago adopted using them as business cards. I don't carry business cards anymore. I carry up stack of mini comics in my bag with me everywhere I go. And because that tells you more about me than a business card can. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, thank you. I think we did a podcast. So yeah, I think we did. <laughs> thanks for, thanks for indulging me. <laughs> I feel like it was a little bit of an indulgence on my part, but not at all. This is, this is great. I'm glad we, I'm glad we, we got to this. And I think, uh, I think there's somewhere in there, there's a, there is a, um, a lot more paths to explore and celebrate comics. There always are. All right, we record the show Thursdays at noon Eastern time. We stream it live on twitch.tv slash lean into art, and then we collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash lean into art and lean into art.com. We'll be back again with another episode soon. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of lean into art.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of lean into art.com, and I'm on Rob Stenzinger on Instagram too. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.